back to the WSBC podcast. My name is Daniel Lewis. I'm the worship leader at Wakulla Springs Baptist Church. We're joined by our pastor, Dr. Randy Creel. Do you want to go ahead and give us a recap of Sunday's message? Well, we've been climbing the mountain towards the peak and pinnacle of the book of Esther. A lot of things have been happening. We were in chapter 7 on Sunday, and it's here that Esther actually presents her request. She presents it to the king. Haman is present. It's a private banquet. And she points out Haman as the one who has been behind this plot all along. She had to really use wisdom in how she presented it to the king because actually he's complicit too. He agreed to it. He was careless. He let Haman just do whatever he wanted to do, gave him his signet ring. You can seal this, make it happen, didn't ask any questions. So Esther has to be very cautious that as she presents this to the king, she does it in a way that he'll listen and the king's so furious when Haman is pointed out that he leaves the room for a few minutes and Haman is begging for his life. The king comes back in and it's like, are you you're going to assault the queen while I'm still in the house? They put the covering over his head. He ultimately is hanged, impaled on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai. And that's where the chapter ends. So over the past few weeks, we've talked a lot about the sovereignty of God, and I even think I said the exact same sentence like two weeks ago on the podcast. So we have talked a lot about the sovereignty of God. So if God is sovereign, why do we need to be wise? Why does it Why does it matter? Okay, let's think through that question. So we said just a moment ago, and I said Sunday, Esther she used wisdom in how she approached this with the king, and that was important. So, so why do we need, need to be wise? If God is sovereign and, and if he's in control and if his plan is going to prevail, what difference does it make whether she, whether she presents this to the king wisely or unwisely? Or you could argue, what difference does it make if she presents it at all? Well, because the Bible commands us to walk in wisdom. And the Bible its its message screams at us over and over again to use wisdom. Jesus even said, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Hmm. The book of Proverbs, the, the wisdom literature of Scripture, it, it tells us how to live life wisely, how to apply the principles of Scripture to how we live our lives. And so it, it does matter. The sovereignty of God is not diminished by us being obedient to Scripture and walking in wisdom. In fact, the sovereignty of God includes how we live our lives, I think. Um, He sees the end from the beginning. He also sees the means to that end, and that's a part of his plan as well. So in the passage, Haman reaped what he sowed. He made the gallows for Mordecai and plotted to kill him, but in the end, it was Haman that died on the gallows. Uh, nowadays, we, we just say that's bad karma. Most of the time, when we use that term, karma, we, we use it more informally, in normal thinking. We don't really tie it to Hinduism or, or Buddhism. It's just bad things happen. Or you do bad things, bad things happen. That's bad karma. You do good things, good things happen. That's good karma. So is it harmful to say that Haman had bad karma? I, I think it is um, because it... It presents an answer to what happened to Haman <clears throat> from a totally different worldview and not from a biblical worldview. Hmm. So karma, it comes from a worldview that is totally opposed to Christianity, to to what the Bible teaches. Um, it comes from a worldview that um, traps and condemns multitudes of people to a lost eternity if they follow that belief system. So I think picking up a word from that worldview that has um, a very different meaning from the biblical concept of sowing and reaping, I don't think that's wise. And I, I think also it is harmful in the sense that it, even if, if I know the difference and even if I'm using it in such a way that that I can distinguish 
like I know I don't mean but you may not know sure what I mean and you're going to assume that I mean something else. So I may have been using the word divorced from its its roots, what its true meaning is, Hinduism, Buddhism. But you don't know that and you may assume that I'm affirming that concept and that's a dangerous thing to do for a believer. I don't want to affirm anything that's false. And so I, I, I need to be careful in how I use my words. And I think also it shows a blurring of the lines. <clears throat> it shows me when I'm supposed to live with a distinctively biblical worldview. I'm, I'm, I'm sliding over into a worldview that's totally different from a biblical worldview. I mean, the whole view of the world is different. And it's blurring those lines, which is it's very dangerous and very harmful to to those that are hearing me speak. And also, it might be that I might be actually sliding my worldview. It doesn't mean I've become a Buddhist or a, a Hindu. It may just mean... I'm not being a thoughtful Christian in what I'm doing. So I I would say, yes, it can be harmful to use terms out of other worldviews carelessly. So what is the main difference between maybe the more literal definition of karma and the biblical idea of reaping what you sow? Well, just as we pointed out, they come from two different belief systems. Right. So that's enough right there that we wouldn't want to be careless in, in using those. Karma karma is a belief system that that whatever's happening to me now or in the future is a result of what I've done either in this life or in future lives. In fact, as sure. I've read it, it tends to focus more on future lives. Like what I did, you know, I might have been a bug 200 years ago or a cow 200 years ago or an evil person 200 years ago and so now I am the karma I'm having to work off my karma from that lifestyle and what I'm doing right now would apply to a future life Um, at least that's my understanding of it Um, so I'm working I got to work off so whatever I did back there I got to pay the price for it now so that I don't have to deal with it again later um, that's why sometimes in in countries that have these belief systems, you look at it and say, well, why don't they believe in helping the poor? Why don't they believe in helping alleviating the suffering of these people? And, and part of the reason is, mm-hmm. at least, they don't want to interfere with, yeah. you're having to pay the price now for what you did then, and if I step in, then you're going to have to pay the price you're going to have to work off this karma. You're going to have to deal with it. So why would I interfere with that process? And that's where that belief system, again, can trap you in in that life with no one willing to help because they don't want to and you don't want. It, it's, it's a really destructive belief system. And, and I think also everything relates. So what I'm going through now if I'm in that belief system, is the result of karma. So sowing and reaping, first of all, that's a that's a common sense. It comes straight out of agriculture. The biblical principle is sowing and reaping is from agriculture. And, and, and the difference is, number one, it deals with this lifetime or eternity. So it's not all confined, but it has nothing to do with any previous lifetimes because I didn't exist in any previous lifetime. Um, But it also can extend beyond this lifetime. For example, um, Jesus said to lay up treasure in heaven. Paul talked about giving, and he said, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But he didn't intend to say that if you give a lot, to your church you're going to become rich it's not a prosperity gospel he is reflecting that that may happen god may bless you like that but there's the laying up treasure in heaven aspect of this where where the reaping might be in eternity as god rewards me in heaven um 
Also, sowing and reaping, I, I tried to point this out Sunday. It's not a belief that everything that happens to me is a result of something that I've sown. Sure. And I used the life of Joseph. There's a lot of bad stuff that happened to him that, that was not the result of him sowing anything. The principle simply is, though, whatever you sow, you will reap. It's not that everything that happens to you is a result of sowing and reaping. Sure. And that does distinguish it from karma. So part of God's plan in this story was to, to flip the script on, on Haman, so to speak. So was the king's decision to hang Haman sinful or was it justified? I think it was justified. <clears throat> Even though... Haman was not seeking to assault the queen. Sure. But he was guilty of seeking to exterminate the Jewish people. Sure. Therefore, the fact that he was hanged on the gallows was completely and entirely justified. So, but as you're saying, did the king sin? Because he... He was unaware. Well, no, she had made him aware. Remember, this is Haman. This wicked Haman is the one behind it. Well, okay. I guess the the reason... What was the reason he was hung by the king? Was it solely because he was... Well, that depends on <laughs> what you believe. Some, sure. some Bible scholars believe that... That... Um, that this gave the king and out so because basically the king is complicit in this as well because he yeah. because he allowed Haman to do this he didn't pay attention to the details and just through carelessness sloppiness hey I want to exterminate a group of people not a group of people but a people group a race okay here's my signet ring just take care of it he didn't even ask who why what where just do it so the charge of you're trying to assault the queen, it, it kind of gave him an out, some believe. Hey, I can execute him for that, not for the other. But in the grand scheme of things, from sowing and reaping, he's being executed on the gallows. Sure, yeah. The big picture, yes, it was justified. Um, also, he did approach Esther. He got closer to her than he should have done and even though he wasn't trying to sure. assault the queen yeah he did violate the protocol and could have been executed for that alone so i don't think Haman has a case like yeah <laughs> let's put it like this Haman did not die as an innocent man he died guilty and i don't mean just in general he's a sinner i mean he's guilty he's behind this plot and he needs to be removed some people actually think um, that that Esther was heartless, hmm. that she should have listened to Haman's plea for mercy and pleaded with the king for Haman's life and, and should have said, hey, he's not trying to assault me. I, I think that's like really overthinking this. She certainly is not going to step in and defend the man that has signed an order to exterminate her people. Mm -hmm. That would be like a Jewish person stepping in to defend Hitler mm -hmm. to keep him from being executed if they would have caught him right, at the end of right. World War II before he killed himself. Uh, that That's not going to happen. Yeah. So through this story... Were the decisions made by the king and Haman a part of God's plan? And is sin a part of God's plan? Just knowing that some of their decisions were sinful, that might be a question someone has in the back of their head. Well, and I think it's, um, it's an interesting question. And on one level, it's not a difficult question, but on another level, it is. So... We've talked about this before, the difference between what God may desire to happen, what God's will is, and what God decrees to happen. So, 
certain decisions made by the king and Haman were certainly a part of God's plan. But the original decision, I wouldn't say that God wanted that to happen. God does not desire that edicts be issued that propose to exterminate the Jewish people. That is not God's will. That is not God's plan in the sense of this is what he desires to happen. But it is a part of God's plan in the sense of what he allows to happen. <clears throat> so is sin a part of God's plan? Let's just jump right to that part of the question. Um, no, in the sense of it is not what God desires. It is not what God decrees or commands. But, yes, in the sense of it is something that God allows, and he allows it, and it happens, God is still sovereign over it, but yet he's not responsible for it. That's, that's the biblical position. So God created a world in which before he ever created, he knew that Adam and Eve would sin, and that would plunge the world into sin and darkness. So could he have created the world otherwise where that was not possible or that would not happen? Well, yes, God could do whatever he wants, but he did not choose to do that. So in that sense, God created a world in which sin was going to be. So in that sense, yes, that's a part of God's plan in that he allowed that to happen. But it's not in the sense that he willed that to happen. That's not what God desired to happen. Just like <clears throat> does God want people to go to hell? Well, no, because the Bible says he's not willing. He does not desire that any would perish. But has God created a world? Does God have a plan, so to speak, in which people do go to hell? Well, yes, absolutely. So from a desire standpoint, no, Sin is not a part of God's plan. He does not desire sin, and he will remake the world. But from a from what he's allowed, yes, sin does not trump the plan of God. It is a part of what God has allowed to exist for his own purposes. I think this is an area that could, of course, we could keep going and going down the rabbit hole where a lot of people can stumble uh, saying, well, if there is a God, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Yes. Um, and also, people can get annoyed with Christians when we just say everything from our God is, is good and everything that's not of our God is bad. And we point at the story and say, all this good stuff, that was God's plan. And whenever they decided to do something that wasn't good, that's not part of God's plan. And I can see skeptics being frustrated with very cookie cutter answers like that so i i, I think it's worth delving into and, but i think what you said is correct when you see <laughs> good things yes every good things come every good thing comes down from the father above that's the book of james and that god does not sin nor does he tempt man to sin that's right. also in the book of james <clears throat> So we can do that, and that is biblically accurate. I'm speaking more of the big picture. Did God plan a world in which he knew sin would exist? Yes. There is no doubt. If we take a different position than that, then we are going to say, well, either God is not all-knowing or God is not all-powerful. Yeah. And and, and we end up in, in trouble. But yes, it can become, I can see, it can become frustrating. Well, if that's all you ever, if you only ever focused on, this is all good, 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 people would say, oh, it's just a feel-good thing. Right. And, and we don't want it, we don't want our faith to be based in feel-good. No, and I, I think we do as Christians need to wrestle with some of these tougher questions. And, and some of them are hard to answer. We're trying to draw a fine line in answering this question that, that says God does not desire people to sin. 
but God is still sovereign over the world. He does allow that to happen and does not thwart the plan of God. And even he may use it for his own purposes. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, yeah. um, he hardened his heart against God. And also the Bible says God hardened his heart. Um, and he was used as an instrument to demonstrate the power of God. I don't think God overpowered him, but yet God is not responsible for the sin of man. Man is responsible for that. That is completely consistent with the truth of the Bible. But yet man's sin does not put him in the driver's seat. God's in the driver's seat. Um, it's an interesting concept to try to explore and however you end up with it you better not end up with making God responsible for sin right? or else God becomes the, the origin of evil hmm. and, and that's not acceptable biblically so throughout the entire book of Esther Haman makes all of his decisions based on his pride so did Haman know he was doing wrong in those moments, or was he just so blinded by his pride that he just thought he was in the right? I don't see anything in the book that indicates that Haman had any idea that he was doing wrong. He thought he was doing what he wanted to do that would advance himself. <clears throat> Why did he want to kill the Jews? Because Mordecai was a Jew and Mordecai ticked him off. I mean, it's a great overreach. Why not just kill Mordecai? I mean... sure. If you have that mindset, but no, he's reaching far beyond that, and he thought he was doing what would best help him. So that's very self-centered, very prideful. I don't think he had any idea that what he was doing was wrong. So from our perspective as well, from does, does God look at unknown sins differently? <sighs> Yes and no. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's super, isn't it? Thank you for listening yep, this week. We'll see you next week. <laughs> um, God, in the New Testament, it says there was a time that God overlooked sins that were done in ignorance. And, and we have to be careful with that, too, because he did judge sins that were done in ignorance. But but that verse continues and said, but now he's commanded all men to repent. So it's not like God didn't deal with sin, but now there is no excuse. He's calling on people to repent. I think um, we're responsible for our sins, whether we're aware of them or not. But the Bible does also say to whom much is given, much is required. So, the more aware I am of God's law, the more responsible I am. That doesn't mean if I'm unaware, I'm off the hook. But there's a, there's a greater level of responsibility and accountability um, to those that are in the know or should be in the know. So I think the question is maybe not whether you're aware or unaware, but should you be aware? And here's what I'm thinking of. The Pharisees were not aware that they were sinning in the way they reacted to Jesus. In fact, they thought they were defending the Scripture. But they should have been aware. There's no excuse. And Jesus scorched them verbally for their hardened, wicked hearts. Because they, of all people, should have known. They had the scriptures. They were the keepers of the scriptures. But, wow, you read some of those things that he said to them. He blistered them. So clearly the fact that they were unaware did not excuse them. Right. Um, <clears throat> on another level, I think that's one of the reasons in the Psalms I think it was David that prayed, Lord, search me, know my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me. So if there's something I am unaware of, God, that's, that is an offense to you, I want you to reveal that to me. I think that's an appropriate prayer. Um, I'm still accountable for what I do. And then we jump to the pagan. 
What about the pagan that hasn't heard of Jesus or whatever? Is he accountable for his sins? And Romans chapter 1 argues that he is because there are certain things that have been revealed through general revelation. That is, that, that this world didn't get here on its own, that there is a God and that he's powerful and I'm accountable for that knowledge. And that's not enough to save me, but it is enough to condemn me. Even it's an old saying, but even the head hunter has an awareness that he does not want his head hunted, that it's not appropriate to do that. And so there's a there's even a moral sense, a conscious. Yes, it's skewed by sin, but I'm not sure we could argue that God looks at unknown sins differently. But we could argue that the more revelation that we've been given the greater our condemnation if we reject that. Yeah. I, th- I think in our life, when we're dealing with people who, have, maybe I'm speaking more broadly, but if someone's made a mistake because they didn't know about something, mm-hmm. you probably wouldn't. You know, you'd be like, hey, you didn't know. Now you know. Don't do it again. But if they did it again you get more frustrated. True, but we can also divide sin, right. a rebellious heart against God, from sins that are individual acts of things. And I'm, I may not be aware that it was wrong to do that, sure. but right. I'm still responsible for my sin, my rebellion in my heart against yeah. God whether I understand down to the details of that or not, um, I'm accountable because I've rejected God. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good place, a tough place to end today's podcast. But thank you guys for listening. If you ever have a question, be sure to send it our way. But thanks for listening. Have a good week.